right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me tonight. Uh, we, this is Orthocynthia Wellington's webinar series, and we're going to be talking about heel pain tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Gordon Young. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about heel pain in adults. Uh, sorry, kids. Uh, heel pain in kids is completely different. So we'll just be talking about adults. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. If I could advance the page here. Uh, it is not moving. Okay. Okay. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, you're all muted, so it's a lot like watching the Bengals game. You can shout at the TV as much as you want, but nobody's really going to hear you. But we will have a question and answer session at the end. So you'll have a chance to uh, ask questions at that point. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, apparently it'll be shown on YouTube. So you can ask your kids how to do that uh, later. But, uh, as far as disclosures, uh, this is where we have to confess if somebody's paying us to advertise a certain something or not. Uh, nobody's paying me for this. So um, that's unfortunate on my part, I guess. But uh, a little bit more. A little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Milwaukee. I uh, went to school locally, and then I went to school and a residency in uh, Chicago. Uh, I spent about eight years in Chicago, and then I joined Wellington Orthopedics in 2002. Uh, last year, we all joined uh, OrthoCincy. So I've been in Cincinnati ever since. Uh, so I'm gradually moving south, it appears. Now, outside of the office, um, uh, I tell people I have three daughters, uh, two of which are human. Uh, my oldest daughter, she's holding the rose there. Uh, she, her name's Gabby. She's up at the Ohio State. She's studying architecture. Uh, Macy is next to her. She's a junior at Sycamore. She wants to study fashion design uh, when she's in college. Um, I cannot be more proud of these two. They are so much smarter than I was at that age. Now, next to them is uh, my Aussie doodle. Uh, she's three and a half, and her name is Friday. Uh, I probably could not have made it through COVID without her. Uh, we're oftentimes seen walking downtown uh, and just putting on a lot of miles uh, because there's nothing else to do. So, now, basically, let's get started here. Uh, there are not all that many things that cause uh, heel pain in adults. Uh, the top two we're going to talk about are plantar fasciitis and insertional Achilles tendonitis. Those are by far the more common conditions uh, I see in the office. Uh, stress fracturing of the heel bone is, is more common than you would probably think. Uh, that's simply where the... Uh, the bone gradually breaks instead of you jumping off a roof and crushing your heel, which is obviously trauma. Uh, the last one I have up there, nerve entrapment, that's actually a very odd and not very common uh, problem at all. But I mentioned that just because it, it involves a different part of the anatomy. But we'll be focusing on the first two. Um, so the first question is, what, what is the plantar fascia? Plantar simply means bottom of the foot. Fascia implies that it's a ligament. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right side, they have this cartoon drawing of the ligament. To geeks like me, it's actually referred to as an aponeurosis, but nobody cares about that. Uh, it could be, it's more commonly referred to as a ligament. It starts at your heel, spreads all the way into your toes. Really, the only reason why we have it is to help support the arch. It's actually the main support in the arch. You have some muscles, some other smaller ligaments too, but the bulk of the work is done by the plantar fascia. Uh, most people, when they come to me uh, with heel pain and plantar fascia, they will, they will be able to point to a pretty specific area on the bottom of the heel. Usually it shades more to the inside of the heel, but it's a pretty precise area. Uh, as you can see, the, the ligament spreads all the way into your toes. So you can theoretically have it anywhere along there, but most people, it's backed by the heel. 
uh, very characteristic that it hurts the first couple steps out of the bed in the morning or after you've been sitting a while. And it almost seems to get better as you keep walking. But then if you keep walking all day, it, it'll just get worse and worse the more you're on it. Then when you get off of it, it uh, starts feeling better. So it just repeats like that. It's, it's not unusual that people come to me after suffering with this for months because it just goes back and forth. Um, but it, m most people will not complain of any shooting pain to the toes, but they'll, they'll often say the pain shoots up the back of the leg. That's more compensation, um, other factors, rather than uh, directly the ligament causing that. But this is a, um, referred to as an overuse type injury. Really in the early going, it, it has elements of an inflammatory condition, but really after a couple of weeks, it's, it's more accurately described as a degenerative condition where the ligament just weakens over time, which really kind of handcuffs us on what we can and cannot do. So, so how do we know it's plantar fasciitis? The, the bulk of the diagnosis can be made just by talking to the patient and going by what they tell us, the description of the symptoms. Um, there are some diagnostic um, tests that we can run, such as an x-ray. That's probably the most commonly done. I like to do that just to rule out a stress fracture. Um, but you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll see a normal x-ray, which is good. Uh, but the patient will see this, and they'll see this little hook-like structure, this little pointy thing at the bottom of the heel. That is what's commonly called a bone spur. We have those things all over our body. Um, a lot of times they don't really matter. Uh, in this area, it, it actually, it has nothing to do with uh, heel pain 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Uh, plantar fasciitis used to be referred to as heel spur syndrome, but that was really uh, not a very accurate description. Uh, the, the, the thought used to be that it, it really did kind of poke you and, and it really caused pain, but we know for a fact now that it, it doesn't do that. What causes that bone spur is there's a little muscle attached to that area. And when we stand, uh, the natural thing is for uh, our arch height to decrease. Well, if that happens, it will stretch the soft tissue on the bottom of the foot, the ligaments, the muscles, everything. So, uh, that tension will, will kind of damage on a microscopic level, the insertion of that muscle. And as part of the repair process, it, it forms bone or ossifies and you get this little pointy little structure. But again, it is not poking you. It really, it, it can, cannot cause pain. Well, I shouldn't say can't, but in almost 20 years of practice, I've only seen four people that have actually fallen and cracked that heel spur. So it, it, that is very difficult to do and usually it doesn't happen. So that pain you feel is really more directly due to the weight. Um, but that, that, is, that is a heel spur. Um, other tests that some people do in office are uh, ultrasound exams. In my opinion, I don't think this is really necessary. I don't think it really gives much definition. Um, and clarity on it. The one on the left is the abnormal uh, ligament. Uh, you can see where they measure it. It's much thicker than the one on the right, which is normal. Um, really, when I look at ultrasounds, I always look for the baby's head and something to tell me if it's um, a boy or a girl. So to me, I don't use ultrasound, but it is a common thing. Um, MRIs uh, can be used. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great study because it gives a lot of information. But there was a study done in the early part of 2000 that looked at the use of MRI for plantar fasciitis specifically. And they determined that 90% of patients uh, would not have anything on the MRI change their treatment or the diet. So there is somewhat limited value in getting an MRI for it. it although the, the cost of an MRI is coming down, it's still, still real money and it's, it's still uh, rather expensive. 
especially when compared to an X-ray, uh, even ultrasound. So uh, it is a very rare situation in which we'll order an MRI for plant fasciitis. Uh, so once we get the diagnosis, well, what do we do? What do we do for this? Uh, we separate treatment into conservative and surgical treatment. The vast majority of the literature, medical literature states that conservative treatment is what gets people over plantar fasciitis. This is really not a surgical uh, problem. Um, now, the first one I have listed here is rest. Uh, more accurately, if I could put rest like 60,000 more times on this slide, that would place the true emphasis on rest. Because again, it's a degenerative condition. The, the ligament is weakened. Really the only way it, it can recover is if you give it time and rest. There is no magic bullet or magic foot rub or anything like that that, that makes that ligament strengthen, uh, unfortunately. And a lot of people are disappointed to hear that, but that is really um, the plain awful truth about it. Now, if we just hang our hat on rest and time, it, it's a very long road and nobody's really gonna do that. So what we try to do is just keep people on track um, with the healing process because there's so many things in life just you know, keeping us on our feet and doing this and doing that. Um, now, the second thing I have is the strapping. Basically that's using athletic tape to uh, mimic the, the ligament itself or the, the support structures of the foot. Uh, there's very specific uh, type tapings. Uh, usually a physical therapist or a athletic trainer can help with that. Uh, stretching is a very um, common treatment for this. If you Google plantar fasciitis, that's one of the first things that you'll get. Uh, stretching basically the back of the leg. Uh, this is actually more of, of a preventative tool. There, Again, there's no magic stretch. In fact, stretching in the early going for plantar fasciitis can actually aggravate symptoms. So I like to have people concentrate on just how they're going to rest first rather than um, you know, try, trying to stretch it out. Really, if you think about it, the strain on the ligament, which causes the symptoms, is a form of stretching somewhat. So we don't really want to um, overload the ligament like that. Uh, and really when we're stretching, what we're stretching are the muscles in the back of the lower leg. You can't really stretch the ligament itself. Um, they have done studies on the ligament and they found that 6% of the fibers of the ligament are elastic, meaning it's about as stretchy as a chunk of wood. So you, it functions much more like a strut. It's not like a rubber band that bounces back and forth. So. So, the, so stretching, again, is more of a preventative tool. Uh, immobilization is next. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying putting, putting you in jail. Uh, really, I like to use a walking boots for something like this uh, because, number one, it slows people down. You know, by slowing, slowing people down and taking fewer steps, you are decreasing strain that way. Uh, it also alters the mechanics of how you walk. Uh, so you can only apply strain to it a few different ways during that. Whereas a normal gait, you go from heel to toe. It's ironically, it's when you push off on your toes, when the heel's not even around, that's where they've measured most of the strain applied to the ligament. So when you're in a boot, you, you really eliminate that portion. Uh, on average, people probably need to use a boot for three to six weeks. Um, it, is, it is interesting, though, because when I put people in boots, sometimes they feel like they can go do anything they want. Uh, the boot doesn't work. You put it on and then you take 20,000 steps a day. Uh, again, it goes back to the rest. Um, the, hopefully, the boot is just a compromise to help you do some of the things your life doesn't fall apart things like that. Um, I, I remember I had a patient, she actually walked um, the flying pig half marathon with a boot on. And that, that is the opposite of what I want patients to do. So, um, 
So this one's uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, medication like ibuprofen, naproxen, you know, even over-the-counter stuff can be helpful, but it should be used for a very short time. Uh, a lot of people get in the habit of taking it for weeks on end. That is probably doing more harm than good because if you take enough of this stuff, you will take away the pain, which can be very bad because pain is what tells you something. So you don't want to hide the pain. And really any use of it probably after a week is, it tends to do that. Uh, depending on the symptoms, I will also prescribe prednisone for some people if their symptoms are severe enough. Again, really, that is the most powerful anti-inflammatory. We do it for a very short time. Uh, a repeated doses of that is probably a terrible idea. Um, but an isolated use of it, uh, it can be very helpful, provided they rest and uh, let it heal. Uh, physical therapy is a very effective treatment for this. Uh, in therapy, they'll do things to help try to stimulate that healing process, things like ultrasound, massage. Some people uh, venture into dry needling. Uh, it's, it's about what it sounds like. They take little little sharp things and you try to stimulate that area. Uh, I personally would probably not want to do that. That just sounds like torture, but some people do have success with it. Um, iontophoresis, uh, that's the use of electrical energy to transfer medication across the skin or uh, rather than injection. Uh, it's a process that doesn't hurt. The downside of that is you, you need multiple treatments and it's more time consuming than anything else. Um, one thing uh, I haven't listed here is orthotics. Uh, a lot of people like to make a big deal out of orthotics and they definitely can be helpful. But the research uh, in regards to plantar orthotics show that over-the-counter orthotics are just as effective as the custom orthotics. This is something that I rarely prescribe custom orthotics to. Uh, if there are durability issues with over-the-counter stuff, then that's usually when I turn to more custom orthotics. But most people do pretty well with off-the-shelf stuff. And just like the stretching, the orthotics are really just a preventative tool. You know, if you, if you get a concussion, putting on a helmet afterwards is not going to help the concussion that you heal at that point. So that's why I tell patients a lot. With plantar fasciitis, the tissue is injured. So just putting something in your shoe or changing your shoe doesn't magically make that heal. Uh, it's, it needs time and rest to heal. But we like to use orthotics because that, that is one of the few things available that automatically takes so many um, <clears throat> Now, what, what, uh, what, what types of injections are available? Uh, a lot of people love the idea of injection because they feel like that's, that's going to be the magic bullet. Uh, and that is the first thing from the there is no such thing as that. The most commonly injected uh, material is steroid uh, or cortisone. There are, most studies do support that cortisone is helpful in the short term. Uh, multiple steroid injections is a terrible idea, especially within a short period. I, I know some patients, they, they've had patients or they've had injections like once a week or like a month, and that that's kind of horrific here, because that is a good way to weaken the weight further, uh, because it'll multiple steroid injections eventually will help break down tissue. But an isolated injection can be part of it. But uh, guess what? On top of that, you do have to rest. Uh, things like that. So if you get a cortisone injection in midweek, and you think you're going to play golf on Saturday. Um, got bad news for you. It's, it's just not going to work out very well for most people that way. Um, uh, this is very interesting uh, because uh, about 15 years ago, they started using this. And this is the same or very similar stuff that they use in cosmetics, uh, plastic surgery, and things like that. But uh, botulinum toxin is actually one of the most powerful toxin in the world. Well, if you use it in micro amounts, it, it'll, it'll 
paralyze their small part. And that's what it's when we inject this, it's actually paralyzing the small muscle attached to the same part of the heel as the ligament. And somehow that's supposed to decrease pain. Um, on paper, this one doesn't make too much sense to me, uh, but some studies do show short-term results are pretty good. Even up to a year, it can be okay. Not every study supports that. So I'm not a big proponent of block blood. <laughs> And I know it's, it, it's probably not fun very much anymore. Uh, Platelet-rich plasma injections, or commonly referred to as PRP, that has been used a lot in the upper extremity and larger tendons. Uh, in the, in the plantar fascia, there's really no great research that proves that it, it works for them. Um, so I can't really recommend that, but I know people this is the thing that uh, probably gets the most press in the, in the media or most attention in the media. Uh, this is what Tiger Woods had done to his elbow a few years ago. He flew to Europe and got his treatment, flew back one of the times. It, it seems to be a very popular technique. Uh, again, pretty effective in the upper extremity from what I understand, but not really. Or at least not. The kicker there is that most insurances don't cover it. You need multiple injections and it runs into the thousands, at least. And it's all out of pocket costs. So to me, the cost benefit uh, is really not there. The last one, uh, amniotic tissue, uh, these are, this is relatively new. Within the last 10 years, we've been using it for a lot of different things, not just for plant infection. But basically, these cells are you know, procured from uh, the placenta and the filter cord that they would normally just come out after. But these cells have the potential to uh, uh, form other types of cells, like ligament tissue, tendon tissue, bone tissue, things like that. Uh, it's technically not the same thing as stem cells, but sometimes it is referred to as that. It doesn't have all the properties of true stem cells, but it really, it's a nice option because with true stem cells, you do have to sacrifice a human embryo. And of course, that is a very hot topic politically. And, uh, so we can totally sidestep that by procuring these cells from different types of tissue. Uh, now this one actually, in my opinion, it does make sense because it's part of what we call regenerative medicine. It's trying to replace uh, diseased tissue with normal tissue that the body makes itself. So I can see that this will be helpful. There have been just a couple studies released uh, that one actually shows no benefit over a cortisone injection. The other does show it is beneficial, but I'm not sure of the quality of the studies, but at least on paper, it makes sense to me. I think, unfortunately, we're probably like 10 to 20 years away from this process being more perfected and uh, tailored to, to certain uh, problems. So now what happens if none of what I just talked about works? Uh, then people oftentimes want to talk about surgery, but I have to remind everyone that the vast majority of the medical literature on plantar fasciitis supports conservative treatment. Um, I would venture to guess that a lot of people who don't respond to that probably haven't tried it for long enough, or their idea of rest is a little different than you know, our idea of rest, and there's not getting enough of that. But I can understand it's very fresh. People want to talk about other things. Now, there have been different surgical procedures described over the years. Um, this is not so popular anymore, but radiofrequency ablation. Basically, they actually use this a lot for pain management, and spinal injuries, and for uh, problems. But for plantar fasciitis, it has really not been that great. It basically use superheat. Um, some type of needle, from what I understand, around a nerve, and it kills off part of the nerve. 
And basically, you're just interrupting the transmission of pain to your brain. Uh, but this, to me, is not, again, addressing the real problem. It's just kind of hiding the problem. Um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. That's basically using ultrasound uh, and dialed in at a certain frequency. This is uh, something that has to be done under sedation. Uh, there are different types of shockwave therapy. All of them have proven to have some uh, positive effect, but there's, again, there's no slam dunk. Uh, a lot of the one-year studies that they affected it seasonally. So a lot of people start having pain again. So it, it's just that maybe it's, it wasn't fully healed by that. But it, it essentially, it's, it's uh, trying to stimulate the healing process. Uh, the old fashioned way is the open resection. Basically, it's done through a small incision. You go down and find a ligament, and then you section part of the ligament, or you release part of the ligament. Uh, in the old, old days, they used to release the entire plantar fascia across the heel. We, we know not to do that nowadays. Uh, it, again, people would have collapsed arches after this, and quite frankly, it would spawn uh, worse problems after this. So even a partial release of the ligament can, has been shown to cause some of these problems. So that's why we say that surgery really is not the answer for the vast majority of people. Uh, an endoscopic procedure has been described basically as the same as the open resection. It's just done for smaller incision and with special instrumentation, but that's the same basic principle. So that's, that's kind of fasciitis in a nutshell. Um, I tell people that if there's any one condition that teaches the patients, it would probably have to be plant treatments. Uh, there is no quick fix, but there is effective treatment if you stick with the program and, and really you know, give yourself a break, okay, rest, rest, rest. Um, and there's definitely ways to help. You. Now, the next condition, we'll go back to this slide. Uh, the next condition is called insertional Achilles tendonitis. So uh, if you look on the right side, you see the Achilles tendon. It, this is referring to pain in the back of the heel, right by the bone. Um, regular Achilles tendonitis is up um, a couple centimeters, uh, more of what we actually think of the Achilles tendon. Is. That, that's completely different. So when we talk about in search of Achilles tendonitis, people will present with pain directly over a bump on the back. A lot of times you will see a little larger bump there, and it will be red. But it is painful anytime they're walking or moving their ankle. Uh, it can burn uh, at times. Uh, one thing that depicted on this picture is what we call a bursa. That is between, that is placed between the tendon and the bone. And sometimes that gets irritated until it. But that can be part of it. Other names for insertional Achilles tendonitis that have been associated with it, uh, some people might refer to this as a Hagelin's deformity. That refers to the bump on the back of the bone, actually. Um, uh, some people call it a pump bump. Uh, these are all, you know, I mean, there's technicalities in that these things are different, but they're all kind of lumped into the same insertional Achilles tendonitis diagnosis. Um, but just like plantar fasciitis, how we know it's insertional Achilles tendonitis is basically what the patient tells us how to describe it. Uh, we do do x-rays for this uh, because unlike the plantar heel spur, which we talked about, the posterior heel spur in the back of the heel, that sometimes can actually be a direct problem if it gets big enough. Uh, on this x-ray, this uh, posterior heel spur is actually pretty big. You get, if you look real closely, you can see the outline of the back of the heel here. It kind of really bows out. And that, that's the part you actually see. But what forms this posterior heel spur is the tendon itself plugs into the back of the bone. And every time it pulls on a microscopic level, you're getting uh, some shearing of that tendon. Uh, how that repairs itself, it just starts to form bone. So this, the size of this spur probably took a couple of years uh, to form, but 
just because you have a big spur like that doesn't necessarily mean you have pain, but it is a huge problem if you do have pain. And that pain is usually more the soft tissue of the tendon itself. Um, now, I put this slide in here because uh, sometimes you'll see these uh, pieces of bone kind of free floating, uh, the one on the left here. So nice to point that out. But those are what we call calcifications. If you ever see that on your x-ray, it's not a good sign because that implies that there is more chronic damage to the tendon itself. So this is kind of getting away from uh, insertional Achilles tendon because it's, it's much higher up. But sometimes we'll see those calcifications real close to the, uh, the actual posterior spur, uh, kind of like on the right side. Now, uh, as far as treatment, a lot of it overlaps with the plantar fasciitis, but automatically I'll put people in a boot for a problem like this because it's really critical to stop the up and down motion of the ankle because every time you go down, it's, that means your Achilles tendon is pulling. So we want to neutralize that. On average, people need it for three to six weeks. Uh, on top of that, a lot of times I'll prescribe physical therapy to include a lot of things. I, I think that ionophoresis is very effective. Um, Anti-inflammatories, uh, depending on what the pain level uh, people come in with, uh, I might add prednisone. Uh, but I generally try to avoid anti-inflammatories for some reason. They do with uh, plant fasciitis because it just has a high degree. Uh, now. Uh, injections are, are really um, where it really differs. This is one area of the body where cortisone injections are completely known. Um, even after one injection, it's been proven that can help lead to a rupture, which nobody wants to talk about. Uh, PRP has been used in this area more traditionally for the run of the mill uh, Achilles tendonitis, not so much for the insertional. Achilles tendonitis, um, but it can be tried if somebody wants to avoid uh, any more advanced treatment. Uh, it, I am not aware of any studies that have used amniotic tissue or uh, botulinum toxin for this. Um, so, what happens when all that stuff is done? Well, then it, usually I'll be getting an MRI to look at the tendon. There are a couple different reasons why you would still be having for like six weeks. Now. One, possibly that there's the launch to repair on the back of the Achilles tendon. But that is extremely resistant to conservative treatments. Uh, and most people would invite to have surgery. So as far as surgery, it's uh, what we call the open technique. Traditionally, it's been a, an incision in the back of the heel. We go down, and the vast majority of the time, we do have to detach the uh, insertion of the tendon from the back of the heel. Then we take off the spur, we remove the bursa if there's one, and then we inspect the tendon. A lot of the tears are on the part of the tendon that it directly attaches to the bone. So it, it looks a certain way when it's diseased. Try to remove as much as possible, repair anything you have. I um, like to apply a special wrap to analyze tissue. I wrap that around to help stimulate new tendon. Um, and um, <clears throat> then we reattach everything to the back of the heel. Uh, afterwards, uh, you're often in a cast or splints or uh, some kind of rigid fixed boot uh, for about four weeks with no pressure on the foot. Um, from there, we keep you in the boots, then you're on the ground, just starting to walk, and then two months of physical therapy. So if you're counting, that's three months right off the bat. But on top of that, anything involving the Achilles tendon, I always tell patients, expect up to a year before you feel like your old self again. Um, you know, most people do come a lot faster than that, but to, to do more athletic things like hike, do some serious hiking or play basketball or whatever. Sometimes it takes a little longer. There is an endoscopic procedure described for this. 
Uh, I guess this is where I show my age a little bit because I don't see how that can really expose the tendon enough to really uh, see what you need to repair. But that has been described. And the advantage of that, they claim, would be a shorter recovery. I'm not convinced. But, but you know, unfortunately, the treatment for insertional Achilles tendonitis is much more limited than plantar fasciitis. Um, so the, the, the issues are a little more chronic, I'd have to say, with the So if, if you don't really do well with conservative treatment, then most people do rely on surgery that. Um, but those are the two most common reasons uh, to, to see me for heel pain. But uh, hopefully you never get them. Hopefully I answered the question. We're gonna move to the question and answer session. I'd have to say that this whole thing has been really weird and nice at the same time because one, I get to talk without a mask. That's real nice. But basically I've been talking to myself for the last half hour plus. So that's kind of weird. But uh, looking at some of the questions here, uh, first, first question is, how can I prevent plantar fasciitis? Yes, uh, prevention is the best medicine, right? Uh, there are so many factors that go into people developing plantar fasciitis that it's hard to account for all. Uh, some of the more common ones uh, are tightness to the back of the leg or the calf muscle. Uh, there's actually two muscles uh, that comprise the calf. And if you don't have tightness with that, it leads to a domino effect that increases more strain uh, to the plantar fascia. So if there's one thing you can do is start stretching. Uh, and this is a stretch we've all been doing since getting married. It's just whatever you're doing for it, multiply it by a million. So uh, it's, it's hard to be too flexible in that area. Uh, now, a lot of people uh, somewhat falsely assume that weight is a big factor. It is definitely a factor, but um, there, people of all sizes get, get plantar fasciitis. It, again, it's it's more of an overuse type injury where the, wig, the uh, ligament just weakens. So you can't do too much about that. Um, let's see. At what point should I seek a doctor for my heel pain? Um, immediately. Just kidding. Um, really, you have to probably just try some of these things yourself at home and maybe say to yourself what is it. But I would say if anything really persists for more than two, three weeks uh, and it's trending worse, you know, you're probably better off getting it checked out just to make sure it's not anything serious or anything like that. Uh, and that, that's probably a good rule for most orthopedic problems. Uh, how long is the recovery process with plantar fasciitis with rest and stretching? Well, that's, that all depends on what you do. You know, for some of my patients, they're postal carriers. Um, with just rest and stretching, uh, it'll probably take like five years. But uh, some people, they, they're accountants and they, they sit behind a desk a lot. And it, it just kind of goes uh, a little more smoothly in those situations. Uh, so that, that's a really uh, an impossible question to answer. I would say most of my patients within a three to six week period of you know, dedicated treatment, we usually can get a handle of it to where they feel encouraged that it will go away. <laughs> um, really, no matter how bad plantar fasciitis is, 99.9% of the time, it does go away. Um, it's just, you know, how, how much do we have to do to, to stop you, <laughs> more or less. Um, uh, let's see. What are common personal health factors that commonly contribute to heel pain? Um, again, it's, it's not necessarily associated with any one other disease or factor. Um, th there are conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic arthritis that will make 
treatment very resistant uh, and they, they are prone to more soft tissue injuries like that. Uh, thyroid issues, I've known that uh, it makes it hard for a treatment to work sometimes. So getting those things under control definitely help. You know, any immune compromised state, even diabetes can be considered like that, that, that can affect it. Uh, but really it doesn't necessarily change the treatment protocol. Uh, all the same treatments will still apply. It's just sometimes the response to those isn't as quick as we want. Uh, why is my heel pain worse when I wake up in the morning? Um, yeah, that is a very common the, um, it, the best way I can explain that is when you get off of it, uh, you are relieving pain, and then the, uh, the healing process starts. Uh, the, the first thing that happens is it's stiff. You know, that's your body's way of preparing for the healing process. It's stiff and really mobilize it. Well, if you sleep, let's say, for eight hours, that is a drop in the blood. Actually, uh, it's like a broken bone. Broken bones take eight weeks to heal. So overnight, you can't expect to be healed. Much like a ligament. Now, a ligament in perfect conditions would not necessarily take um, eight weeks to heal in most cases, but it probably takes like four to six weeks. Uh, so eight hours is not enough. So by the stand on the morning, you're kind of recreating that trauma. That's uh, probably what you're feeling. I'm just reading through these questions here. Um, here's a good question. Um, once I have heel pain, is it something I will likely always experience or is it often able to be fully cured? Um, you can fully cure plantar fasciitis. Um, the mere fact that you have the ligament and that you're human means that you can always incur. It's, it's kind of like asking, you know, how can I not break a bone ever again? Uh, you really can't do that. So that, that's the bad news. But uh, most people, once they get over an episode of it, uh, usually it's separate, episodes are separated by, um, you know, years. But as long as you're controlling the factors that lead you to get it, overuse, uh, lack of proper support, uh, tightness of the calf, things like that, then you can keep it at bay. So, but I think we're all up there. It's, uh, thank you once again for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, different webinars and different topics. And hopefully, you'll join us for that as well. Right. Have a good night. Stay safe.